Welcome to Living Well with MS. This podcast comes to you from Overcoming MS, the world's leading multiple sclerosis healthy lifestyle charity, which helps people live a full and healthy life through the Overcoming MS program. We interview a range of experts and people with multiple sclerosis. Please remember, all opinions expressed are their own. Don't forget to subscribe to Living Well with MS on your favorite podcast platform so you never miss an episode. And now, let's meet our guest. Michael Greger, MD, is a physician, author, and speaker. He wrote the international bestseller, How Not to Die, as well as the How Not to Die cookbook. He founded NutritionFacts.org, the first science-based non-commercial website to provide a free daily videos and articles on the latest discoveries in nutrition. So, Dr. Greger, welcome to Living Well with MS. Is that how you pronounce your name, by the way? I've it read is it indeed. Dr. Yeah, Greger, excellent. you nailed it. Excellent. Um, so welcome to the podcast. So to start off with, could you introduce yourself? Um, tell us how you became interested in plant-based nutrition and a bit about Nutrition Facts, The Daily Dozen, and any other projects that you're currently working on. Ah, all right. Well, um, in terms of why I do what I do, it all really comes back to my grandmother. Um, I was just a kid and my grandma was diagnosed with end-stage heart disease and sent home in a wheelchair to die. Uh, she already had so many bypass operations, basically run out of plumbing at some point, confined a wheelchair, crushing chest pain. Her life was over at age 65. Just heard about this guy, Nathan Pritikin, one of our early lifestyle medicine pioneers. And what happened next is actually detailed in Pritikin's biography. He talked about Frances Greger, my grandmother. And they wheeled her in and she walked out. Um, uh, though she was given a medical death sentence at age 65, thanks to a healthy diet, was able to enjoy another 31 years on this planet till age 96 wow. to continue to enjoy her six grandkids, including me. That's why I went into medicine. That's why I practice lifestyle medicine, why I started nutritionfacts.org, why I wrote the book, How Not to Die, why all the proceeds from all my books are all donated directly to charity. I just want to do for everyone's family what Pritikin did for my family. Well, that's quite a story. I was completely unaware of that. Um, so overcoming MS, I'm not sure if you're aware, is an evidence-based program to help people living with MS. Um, and through numerous studies, including, I mean, originally Roy, Stank, Roy Swank's longitudinal study and ongoing research, um, particularly at the Neuroepidemiology Unit um, at the University of Melbourne from Dr. Jelinek, and elsewhere, um, that says that whole food, plant-based diet, and in, in our case, we have plus fish, um, has a demonstrable positive impact on symptoms and quality of life for people with MS. And we'll get back to the fish bit as a later question. Um, but there's many neurologists who claim that there's no um, evidence for a specific diet for MS. Um, so could you talk a bit about the history of uh, controlled trials the influence of big pharma, big tobacco, big su big sugar on the public's um, understanding and, and also medical professionals' understanding of nutritional research. Yeah, so um, uh, you'll see systematic reviews coming to the conclusion that uh, diet um, uh, has not been shown to impact the disease, but this is based on their criteria that may only accept um, randomized controlled trials as acceptable evidence. This is certainly um, a good uh, a good practice when it comes to something like drugs, something like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, in the States here, uh, 106,000 Americans are killed by prescription drugs, uh, not overdoses, not illicit drugs, just drugs as prescribed. And so, mm. I mean, if, if they're uh, it's making them a leading cause of death. So I'm um, for... Wiping out, we certainly want to make sure have excellent evidence that the drugs are going to cause more benefit than harm. Um, but when we're talking about something, and so so that model that we want randomized control, placebo controlled, ideally uh, randomized against a sugar pill, um, to make sure that uh, that that the, you know the the pros outweigh the cons. That same mindset is. Uh, been used to assess nutritional interventions, um, and the which I mean, and I, I mean, I, I like where that that's coming from. We want to have the most robust evidence possible, but there are no downsides to eating a healthier diet, or exercise, or smoking cessation, etc. 
And so we don't necessarily need the same vigor of evidence. So, for example, there's never been a randomized controlled trial of smoking cessation. Mm -hmm. They didn't, I mean, they, I mean, of, of, um, because it's very difficult for people to do it. Um, and so, uh, because of, uh, problems with compliance, you cannot randomize a, a group of people to either smoke or not smoke for a few decades and see who gets lung cancer. Especially so the placebo. Really, how do you do the, and you, right, you, know, you can't even do it. Right. All right. Oh, that's a good point. Right. And so you'd have to have some kind of like tobacco flavored, like, cigarette that didn't actually have harmful smoke or something. Right. I mean, right. Okay. So you can see you can't do that study. So in that kind of uh, diet has no impact on MS mindset, you could say, well, we don't have evidence that stopping smoking or it's starting smoking causes lung cancer. There's never been randomized controlled trial. Um, but what we do have is this observational evidence where we follow populations of people who smoke, Versus those who don't smoke, we try to match them for other criteria. So we want, you know, smokers versus non-smokers at the same weight, at the same exercise levels. And you match all those other criteria, and you find out, wow, the smokers have, you know, uh, you know, you know, ten times the lung cancer rates of non-smokers. Um, and you do that in a bunch of different ways. And so the best available balance of evidence suggests, you know, smoking is really a bad thing to do. And so even though there's no randomized control trials, we don't smoke. And we tell people not to smoke. Um, and so that so we're in the same situation with, in many cases, with diet. Um, it, um, there are certain foods that are so potent, like certain spices, you can actually put them in a pill, like garlic powder or something, into a capsule and randomize them against a sugar pill and actually show different effects. Uh, but most foods, you know, people know notice when something's going in their mouth or not. It's very difficult to do placebo control trials. And even randomized controlled trials are difficult because of, again, the compliance issue. Um, and so we are left with this kind of observational evidence where you have cohorts of people, in fact, huge cohorts. Some of the Harvard cohorts, over 100,000 people. Um, we have a AARP cohort, over half a million people. The UK Biobank, 400,000 people. Follow, them over to, follow people, their diets, and their diseases over time. And you can statistically tease out, oh, wow, the people that eat these foods tend to live longer, even when matched for all these other um, uh, criteria. Um, and so based on that kind of evidence, you can say, wow, you know, this, you know, drinking soda, yeah, it does not look like it's good for you. Oh, but drinking green tea, oh, that does seem like it's good for you. And so we can make those kind of, and now, now someone can say, wait a second, you know, you've never done the randomized control trials. And I'm like, yes. You're in that pharmaceutical mindset. I understand that. But, you know, worst comes to worst. And, you know, broccoli really isn't good for you. Like, what's the worst thing that can happen? People eat broccoli, right? I mean, so that's why it's understandable that they want this hierarchy of evidence. They want those randomized control trials. We're often just un simply unable to give them, particularly because some of these diseases take decades um, to develop. Um, and so we fall back on observational evidence and we have tremendous mounds of evidence implicating certain foods in various diseases in not only prevention or arrest, but even reversal in some cases. Um, and, you know, we can look around the world and see how different di different disease rates differ and have a sense. Oh, well, that's not just genetic. The fact that you know, there's a, uh, you know, a hundred fold difference in lung cancer rates in different populations. You'd be like, whoa, maybe there's some, there's some factor that one population has higher rates than the other. And you can do that with all sorts of diseases. Then you do migration studies where, you know, people, men from Japan moving to San Francisco, all of a sudden start, uh, and they start living like Americans, they start dying like Americans. All of a sudden their prostate cancer rates shoot up but their stomach cancer rates drop because they're not eating some of the salted fish and some other things. And so that's how we can tease out genetic factors, even though we don't have really these best, um, uh, the, 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 the highest quality of evidence, which we uh, require for drug trials. And so when you do that with MS, for example, and you look at some of the healthiest populations historically, like uh, about a century ago in sub-Saharan Africa, where people were, in the rural areas, we're living almost exclusively plant-based diets, extremely high fiber diets, um, no processed foods, no added salt, 
There is a study with a population of 15 million people, not a single case of multiple sclerosis in a population of 15 million. And so it says, well, wait a second. Uh, so maybe there are environmental causes, including diet, that may play a role. And that's the kind of data that got Dr. Swank and others excited about the possibility of changing people's circumstances and changing disease rates, and in his case, exa um, you know, recurrence rates. And so to talk a bit about some specifics of, of the diet that we follow, um, Overcoming MS recommends that people with MS can eat as many beans and legumes as they like. But there are other, there's several other um, MS diets, which are the major ones are very similar in many ways. Um, but many of those say that beans and legumes do contribute to leaky gut syndrome. Um, what's your understanding of that? What's the science um, about the causes of leaky gut and whether beans could contribute towards that? The most important thing to decrease in intestinal permeability or, or, or kind of seal up a leaky gut is uh, the short chain fatty acids that our body makes from fiber and resistant starch. Those prebiotics that we eat are turned into by our good gut bacteria into what are called postbiotics, short chain fatty acids like butyrate, which um, actually feed the lining, the cells that line our colon and are able to establish those tight connections. So when I have little pieces of food, uh, you know, and, and bacteria slipping into our, our bloodstream, what are the most concentrated sources of fiber in the diet? Number one, well, whole intact grains and legumes, depending on which okay. one, um, but in general, probably legumes or beans, split peas, chickpeas, and lentils are our most important source of uh, fiber and also whole grains because they're drier foods. Since most of fruit and fruits and vegetables, certainly all whole plant foods have fiber, but you know, uh, fruits are like 90% water, vegetables are like 80% water. Um, and so that's why some of these drier foods like the grains and legumes are the most concentrated sources of fiber. Okay, so that's a good one for us. So we're, um, so we're okay with beans and legumes. That's very, very good for me. Um, I have quite a lot of beans and legumes. Um, and on a similar vein, um, overcoming MS doesn't eliminate gluten unless uh, there's a specific gluten problem. Now, in the UK, we are uh, routinely tested. If you're diagnosed with MS, they actually test you for gluten intolerance um, oh. anyway. So I was tested. Um, and so, but tested many with, MS... Uh, tested with... Uh, I had happy or just so uh, many test? tests at the start. Blood test it would be, I think. Blood yeah. test, okay. I... I they, there were so many tests when I got diagnosed because yeah, they test you for all the other things that it could be other than MS. So um, right, right. No, I, I asked about I asked my neurologist about gluten. He said, "Oh yeah, you were tested for that." And I was like, "Oh really?" I was unaware of this. And he said, "Yeah, it's routine. We just do everything." Um, so so one of those things it, it says um, it doesn't eliminate um, gluten. It does recommend whole grains. Um, you know, obviously not heavily processed um, breads and so on. But many other MS diets do eliminate gluten, um, and some of them even eliminate all grains. I think you've mentioned that grains are a good thing. But um, what what would the science say behind gluten sensitivity? It does seem to be an, an increasing trend. Um, and should you try to eliminate gluten, do you think? It's, um, and that's like saying, you know, are, are peanuts healthy? Well, for most people, but not for people with a peanut allergy, mm -hmm. obviously. It could, they could drop dead from eating a peanut. Um, and same thing with with uh, with gluten. About uh, one in 147 or so folks have uh, celiac disease. Um, about another one percent ish have gluten uh, sensitivity, so they don't have celiac disease, but uh, uh, have uh, can be tested in in blinded challenge trials to show that they do have. Um, a gluten sensitivity, even though most people actually fail that they think they're gluten sensitive, but then you give them, you know, wheat flour pills versus rice flour pills. They can't tell the difference. Um, and, uh, and then there's about one in a thousand people who have a wheat allergy, actually. Um, and they're, you know, kind of tongue swells or throat closes. Um, and so, but other than that, so other than the kind of well, maybe one in 50 who have uh, either celiac or gluten sensitivity, so 45, 49 out of 50 people, um, then we certainly wouldn't want to cut out um, gluten-containing grains, you know, wheat, barley, rye, because they're such good sources 
of, uh, of fiber. And um, something with there's a similarity with um, your daily does, doesn't and overcoming MS is to supplement um, with flaxseed oil. So overcoming MS, re, re, oh, sorry, overcoming MS recommends between 20 and 40 mil of cold pressed flaxseed oil daily. Um, and what are the health benefits of um, supplementing that way? In some places, it's called linseed oil as well. It's, just, it's the Not same I'm, thing. Yeah, I'd, I mean, I'd rather people get their uh, flaxseed oil within their flaxseeds. So uh, from ground mm -hmm. flaxseed, so that's part of my daily dozen. Um, just because in addition to getting the uh, short chain omega-3s, the alpha linolenic acid in those flax seeds in, that's found in the oil, you also get it's a nice low soluble fiber, but most importantly, the lignans, uh, which are these cancer-fighting compounds, which are not found in oil. In fact, you can see some so-called high lignan flaxseed oil, and then you look at the ingredients, all it is is flaxseed oil, plus ground flaxseed, like they sprinkle a little yeah, ground flaxseed in, in yeah. and that makes them high, but of course not anywhere high compared to actual ground flaxseed. And so, yeah, that's why I'd recommend um, a tablespoon of ground flax every day, um, just because there's there's other things that you'd be missing as well. And uh, and they uh, they last much longer and last for um, uh, for you know months in a uh, airtight container, even at mm -hmm. room temperature, as opposed to, because the natural, you know the the, the hole um whereas you know flaxseed can go rancid uh, pretty quickly. yeah and and what about other oils well i mean the people uh, some people are using algae oil for similar omega-3 oh yeah so for the long chain if you want to supplement to directly get uh, those long chain omega-3s as opposed to elongating the short chain omega-3s found in flax and walnuts and greens um, then, right, you can certainly, if you want a pollutant-free source, you know, the mercury and some of the PCBs and other things found in, um, in fish oil products because of our polluted world, then, yeah, you can get algae, which just kind of, they just grow it in a stainless steel tank and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and extract it. Yeah, so there's uh, algae-based DHA, EPA. And they're all just going to see each other then. So there's no yeah, yeah, yeah they're, they're, they're considered bioequivalent. And um, one thing that's common in people with MS is an iron deficiency. Um, and this is something that's brought up because, I mean, me growing up, I would assume if you want more oil, if you want more iron, you would eat steak sure. because that's what most people think. So um, and it, so if it is more common in, in, in people with MS than the general population um, and it does contribute to some symptoms like fatigue and so on, what's the best way to keep your iron levels high? or higher with a plant-based diet? Yeah, so vegetarians and vegans actually don't suffer higher rates of uh, iron deficiency anemia, but that's not saying much because uh, there's such high rates, one of the uh, leading nutrient deficiencies, particularly among uh, menstruating women. Uh, to get enough iron uh, from plant-based sources, you are combining uh, sources of iron, um, uh, like, uh, like legumes, whole grains, with... Um, a vitamin C rich food, uh, the vitamin C actually uh, improves the absorption of plant-based iron. So vitamin rich, uh, C rich foods are citrus, uh, tropical fruits, broccoli, bell peppers. You just want to have it all in your stomach at the same time. Um, and that'll improve your, uh, your absorption. And so this is, this is something where I think there might be a difference, certainly with the overcoming MS diet pillar to yours, is that it does include seafood if desired so it's an it's not a you should eat seafood regularly but it's if if desired seafood is acceptable um a couple of times a week to improve omega-3 to omega-6 and 9 ratio um so up to i believe three servings of oily fish a week so firstly um what are the best ways to get dha and e epa and and what are the risks associated with fish consumptions and and is there a you know what's the best alternative um in a plant-based diet yeah so these are essential fats meaning we can't make them we have to get them in our diet um and uh, they're essential for the fish too the fish don't make these there they get it from the bottom of the food chain which are these algae so we can kind of skip the skip the middle fish and go straight to the algae source and so the advantage of algae based um is uh, is that we don't have to worry about the pollutants. Even distilled fish oil can get rid of some of the heavier compounds like mercury, but unfortunately we'll still get like, you know, the flame retardant chemicals and the PCBs and the dioxins, some of these 
Um, uh, these or, uh, organochlorine pesticides have been banned, like DDT and Dialdrin, et cetera. Unfortunately, our, he, the oceans are basically humanity's sewers. You know, all the mercury from all the coal plants in China eventually, you know, settles into our waterways. And so the highest levels of these industrial pollutants really build up <laughs> in our waterways. Um, and so if we could go, you know, in a time machine back for the Industrial Revolution, it's kind of a different thing. But now we've just so polluted the world that, uh, you know, it's probably better to get those mega-3s either from, uh, from the, you know, having our own bodies elongate them from, from, uh, from the short chain uh, <coughs> LA in uh, flax or taking them directly from an algae or other pollutant-free source. So you wouldn't be a completely, I mean, we say a whole, whole food plant-based diet, but then you would be happy to supplement in in terms of things like, would you, I'm presuming the algae would, you'd have as a, um, you know, whether it's an algae oil or, or a, you know, be a supplement, presumably. Oh, well, I mean, I, 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 I mean, I have nothing in principle uh, against supplements for those who need it. I mean, I, urge everyone on a plant-based diet to ensure a regular reliable source of vitamin b12 that's probably the most important that, i was going to ask yeah and yeah. so yeah absolutely i mean and those don't get enough sunshine may need vitamin d i mean it's just kind of how we live if we're pregnant you may need some things if you're an alcoholic you need different uh, supplements i mean it's it's just what uh you know what, what people need is what people need yeah okay because i i mean i so personally um i supplement with vitamin d vitamin b complex and um and flaxseed oil and i and I take a probiotic as well although I, I do try and have fermented foods um but yeah i have a, a probiotic tablet every day so that's absolutely fine with your approach uh i mean i mean if you need it if if you think you need it then then you know i mean I uh, I don't recommend uh, taking probiotics. I recommend you know feeding your own good gut flora, you know, okay. with prebiotics, so that you know they 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 are fruitful and multiply without having to to uh, take any directly. I mean, we just don't and, know enough about the microbiome to be able to use a few target species and uh, right, affect okay. the growth in a way that our body. It's hard to outsmart our bodies. And fermented foods. Would that be a well, the problem is uh, too many. Kombucha? Well, the problem is too many have added salt, and that's particularly a concern for anyone with an autoimmune disease. You know, you do not hear a lot um, in the MS community talking about salt, but there are these TH17, um, these autoimmune cells, these pro-inflammatory immune cells, which are activated by sodium intake. Um, uh, you know, uh, you do observation. Here's these population studies again on um, those with MS who eat more, consume more sodium, have you know, three times the, the exacerbation rates have, uh, you know, uh, you know, twice the, 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 the brain lesions over time. And we do not yet have interventional studies where you randomize MS sufferers to low cell diets and see if it actually improves the course of disease. But the best available data we have is we really need anyone with any autoimmune disease really needs to lower their um, sodium intake. And so something like sauerkraut, um, uh, which, you know, kind of by yeah, definition sauerkraut does have a lot of salt. It's just uh, packed with salt. Yeah. And that's to, you know, diminish the growth of the bad bugs. Kombucha, um, on the other hand, doesn't. That's that doesn't have salt in oh, it. So oh, but yeah, yeah. I, I mean there's there there are there are certainly um but like tempeh is a fermented mm -hmm. food, it's fermented with a, a fungus. Um, and so you don't have to use salt. Um uh, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, typically fermented foods uh, there's a sodium problem. Yeah, we have discussed that actually with a, with a, oh, uh, a chef fantastic. on a previous podcast, and, oh, and it was quite interesting because he's um, he lives in he's America, he lives in Europe as a chef, and he said so. What you've got to think about is how much salt you're actually using. People start to to remove salt in the wrong way, and they say that what they remove is they're removing salt from the water they're cooking pasta in. If you move, remove a teaspoon of salt from the water you're cooking pasta in, you're practically getting rid of no salt because you're pouring that water away. So you, you measure the amount of salt you have left on the pasta. It's hardly any. It's mostly used to separate the pasta. And but what you're doing is you're still leaving a teaspoon of salt on your fries when you when you have those. That that you're consuming all of it. So the, yeah, yeah the pro also processed space. foods tend to be just packed with sodium. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so um, 
one of the things that's come up recently in the um, MS community is Epstein-Barr virus. They're increasingly mm. thinking this is a trigger factor for multiple sclerosis. Um, but are there certain foods that reduce chances of viral flare-ups in our diet? Um, I think the only thing... Um, uh, let me think. I'm just looking at my uh, nutrition facts. <laughs> Uh, right now, with there's only 2,000 videos, so I'm often going to my own site to figure out the. Uh, um, two, two, two. Oh, yeah, so there's a reduction um, in EBV reactivation uh, with chlorella. I'm trying to see how much. So, chlorella is a um, kind of a one cell green algae that's sep not blue green algae, but just it's a green algae. Um, that's been found, I'm actually not seeing the dose here, um, been found to not only boost IgA levels, which is a, um, uh, an antibody released to your mucosal membranes, but uh, significantly um, uh, reduce uh, reactivations of latent viruses like EBV. Okay, and that was this is um, from your website, you're finding this yeah, information. Yeah. So this is all available, and, and I would encourage people to, to look. There's huge amounts of information. Um, so another thing that I wanted to uh, touch on was the gut brain axis, the vagus mm. nerve, and that our gut is our second brain is often, is often referred to. So how can we best feed our gut, gut microbiota to promote um, a gut brain axis health? What's the, what's the best thing we can do? I mean, we've talked a bit about prebiotics, but what actually, I mean, how does that, what does that look like? Yeah, That's no, it. it's uh, it's promoting the, the growth of our good gut bugs, which is uh, feeding them with prebiotics. So that's resistant starch, fiber. That's what they eat, um, and uh, and they produce these short chain fatty acids, which are absorbed in the bloodstream, actually pass through the blood brain barrier, um, and uh, and can affect our mental states, can affect our immune system. Um, or have anti-inflammatory effects. That's why fiber in the uh, dietary um, um, anti-inflammatory dietary inflammatory index the most anti-inflammatory component in our diet is fiber it's because of what our good gut bugs do with it um so you know you can you know eat a fiber rich meal and immediately see a reduce in you know asthma exasperation rates and um has anti-inflammatory effects throughout the body um and uh yeah it's feeding our good gut bugs uh and uh, not feeding the bad ones you know like with uh Carnitine and choline, which uh, foster the growth of bad gut bugs and make a toxin called trimethylamine oxide, which is associated with uh, cardiovascular disease as well as kidney disease. So overall, if we're heading for a plant-based, whole food diet, high in fiber, low or no processed food. Love it. Then that's going the right way, yeah? As a, just that as a is general. absolutely going the right way. Because you can, I mean, there's increase, increasing veganism in the Western world. There's a whole row in our supermarket of vegan food. I, I wouldn't touch any of it, to be honest. It's the most, you just think, yeah, it is vegan, technically. There's no animals in there. Right, right, no, no. But so that, right. heavily processed and, oh, high, and so, heavily sorted. Yeah. I'm so glad you said that. that that's why, um, that's why, yeah, I, I describe the healthiest diet as a whole food plant-based diet, not a vegan diet. I mean, vegan diet just tells me what you don't eat. Right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I mean, you could, you know, I see you go to these, see these collate, collegiate vegans living off of French fries and beer or something completely vegan. But I mean, just absolutely abysmal, horrible diet. Um, whereas, oh, whole food plant based. Oh, you actually eat your vegetables. Oh, wow. There we go. Now we're talking. Um, so, yeah, you can eat a miserable diet. That's why I'm really concerned about these people that, you know, go towards a more plant based diet, not for health reasons, but for like uh, ecology reasons or animal welfare reasons. And so they just reach for a vegan donut and that's really not doing their bodies uh, any favors. And just as a final wrap up, is there any other studies on diet and MS or autoimmunity in general that we haven't touched on that we should know about? Uh, I think we hit the major ones. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Saturated fat. Sodium, anti-inflammatory, we nailed all the good ones. That's good. So, um, I, oh, obesity. Obesity increases the risk of uh, of MS. I don't know about um, once you already have it, but I know uh, it's uh, associated with increase in uh, incidence. But I've found everyone who follows the diet that we follow 
it you oh, yeah, your you body know. seems to naturally let get yeah. they, they people lose weight quite dramatically to start yeah, with and then it seems to actually naturally level off and and um yeah yeah it does seem to be if you give your body natural food it just seems to sort itself out in my what a concept an expert opinion yeah remarkable so with that i'd like to thank you very much for joining us and encourage everyone have a look at the show notes because um firstly there's the evidence uh, there's your website with huge amounts of information there's every evidence in the um, how not to die book and also uh, one thing if people are moving to an overcoming ms lifestyle and diet we're always looking for a good cook- cookbook so um it's, oh, good. it's one of the go-to cookbooks where you can basically um yeah ev- everything on there is is pretty compliant anyway um so yeah a useful uh, how not to die cookbook is also a useful resource so thank you very much for joining us Absolutely. Thanks. Keep up the good work. Thank you for listening to this episode of Living Well with MS. Please check out this episode's show notes at overcomingms.org slash podcast. You'll find useful links and bonus information there. Have questions or ideas to share? Email us at podcast at overcomingms.org. Or you can reach out to Jeff on Twitter at Jeff Alex. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks again for tuning in and see you next time for tips on living a full and happy life with MS.